great talk. I have my ear to the wall and getting pieces of it. Thank you, Hillman. Uh, it's kind of a perfect segue into this one. I wanted to talk about uh, sort of the motivations at a higher level of what was happening at a meta design with Odd World Inhabitants. And then we went through a cycle where uh, in 94, I started the company with a brilliant partner, Sherry McKenna. Uh, I demanded she run it because I knew she was smarter than me. I had seen her handle Hollywood Studios, so I thought maybe she'd be able to handle game publishers. And uh, and since that time, there's been a lot of changes in the industry. When we went through a lot of curves, and one of the things that was sort of pivotal to me in this whole concept of business in the West was if you read Donald, book, Donald Trump's books uh, on business, or you read business books coming out of Wall Street, uh, a lot of them would say this common saying: "You make business decisions with your heart, and all you'll wind up with is heart disease." So this is like a common mantra within the Ivy League of, of the Whartons, the Harvards, the Yales. <laughs> and on the other hand, we have the greatest music sales of all time. We have people like John Lennon. We have creators. And they came at it from exactly a different perspective, which is their heart was emblazoned into their work. And if there's any movies you've ever really loved, any songs you've ever really loved, any novels you've ever really loved, there's a lot of heart in them. So we have this conflict. And when I was a kid growing up, the reason I was re reading business books because I was terrified of being poor, I was already poor, and I was looking at what was happening in the world around me, 60s and 70s, and I was seeing these passions, <laughs> and I always knew I wanted to be a storyteller, but I was seeing these passions in cultures, and I was trying to figure out, like, wow. Yeah, I remember seeing the, the, the girls just overpowering cops at Beatles concerts, and I was like, how do you do that? I mean, it was awesome the bikers and their commitments to certain brands, that if you argued with them, you know, you actually could risk your life. Uh, and then Trekkies, which was very similar. They wouldn't kill you, but they'd nag you to death if you disagreed with their concepts. <laughs> <laughs> and what I saw was this sort of ultimate cu uh, customer retention, where people felt so passionate about certain products or certain properties that they would actually brand it on themselves for life. It meant that much to them. So for me, I was looking at ways and what was happening with creators that had that sort of potency? And so in many ways, this talk is about the motivation of creators. And in some ways, trying to help the finance aspect understand better where some of these people are coming from. And if you look at real creators that made a difference, Jim Henson was one of my greatest heroes. Because I learned how to read not from school. I learned how to read from Sesame Street. And that was like uh, an understanding of what was the possibility of media. And television could could teach me something that wasn't working as, in, as well at school. But when we look at creators, we also see that these are people who stuck with their creations. We have a young Jim Henson there. I mean, look at that frog. You probably never even saw that version of Kermit. You know, but later in life, uh, he was still as equally married to it and very passionate about it, very cared about what his characters meant to his audience. And then we also had uh, Theodore Seuss, who was uh, equally committed to creating brands, to creating fables that basically gave better compasses for the heart and better, healthier ways to look at the world. And today, we still read those same stories that our parents were reading, and sometimes our grandparents were reading to our parents. And we're still reading them to the kids today. And then there was the guys that were really stepping it up to another level. George, Hero, George Orwell was a huge hero of mine. And he was something that never would have passed today's standards. He never would have passed through a big publisher. He never would have passed through a big movie studio because he took personal perspectives and said, you need to know this. You need to wake up. He understood this because he worked for the Ministry of Propaganda in the UK after, during the war. He understood what was going on. And he embodied that into content to try and give you wake up pills. And it was non-sanitized. So you could just imagine the marketing meetings that would be chopping. <laughs> you know, what would uh, Big Brother look like? Or what would uh, 1984 look like had it gone through the, the editing of a public company that was concerned about you know, its publishing and its other IPs and the impacts that might have with their audience, et cetera, et cetera. You get the point. <laughs> Some of them even built empires. You know, one of the things Walt said towards the end of his life was, I hope what everyone always remembers here is that this was all built on a mouse. And, uh, you know, Disney became something else today. But it still is one of the best orphanages for these types of characters to be created. It, take, it fiercely looks after the creations. Then a hero to me just blew it out of the water uh, with things that I was experiencing in life that I'll get to shortly was George Lucas. And combined with the messaging that he was bringing from 
uh, from Joseph Campbell. And what he did was basically he was doing samurai monks in space. Right? And the idea was, was that there was this deeper connection and understanding that we're all maybe more connected. We're all maybe more connected to all things that are alive. And this hit a time when we had maybe in many ways a spiritual deficit particularly in the, in the West, particularly in the United States. Religious uh, numbers were falling. Uh, new agey stuff was kind of turning a lot of people off. And people just felt like there's something more, but they weren't really, they weren't finding any brands that were really identifying where their heart was to the world. And I thought Lucas really knocked it out of the park. You know, as a kid, when that came out, it just, it just, it changed my life. It made me new things I wanted to do, but it also made me say, my God, you know, what, Bible classes weren't doing, what this philosophy or that philosophy wasn't doing, a movie could actually do. And it really made me believe in the possibilities of entertainment for change. And it was remarkable. And the thing about these creators is those that were, had, had more intent behind their creations was they're very fiercely protective of them, not necessarily uh, obnoxiously, but they were fiercely protective of the idea of what these things should sustain, not how they should change over time due to a certain market condition. And in many ways, that's what gave them the longevity that they had. And in many ways, I look at it and I go like, creators uh, who aren't just making an IP to get out there, you know, and I'm totally capable of that. So in this case, I'm just talking about the odd world brand. And that brand had a different intent. And when you embody, embody so much more of what is happening in the relevance of the world around you into the content, you're more like the natural parents, right? And then when, you, when it gets to the point and expectations, if you're successful, you're supposed to sell that into the foster home. And what's interesting is the best creators through time that held and, and uh, gave longevity to various properties, they never gave it up to foster homes. And at Oddworld, we were kind of looking at it that way. You know, we didn't start with a business strategy. Uh, I mean, we, we lightly did, but we didn't have an exit strategy. We were kind of clueless in a lot of ways. We just wanted to make cool stuff. We, we were looking at it more like rock bands. Like, how does, you know, what would Pink Floyd do if they were making games? You know, like, how do we, how do we get it more interesting and more relevant? And then something else is happening, what's happening. I found that very sort of disillusioned. I call it the tale of two kings. So when Lucas knocked it out of the park with Star Wars, he became the man. And, and the expectation is, is that if you get create characters of high visibility and high value, then you license them to the highest bidder. And so we see then these high ideals of protecting the environment, these high ideals of we're all connected to nature, and all of a sudden it's labeled and onto the least healthy products uh, that are being pushed by the largest companies that today are showing us exactly what the results of that are. If you had your ear to the ground 20 years ago, you knew what was wrong with uh, various practices, why it would lead to a diabetes generation. Uh, these things were fairly obvious. And there was deceptive practices happening across the board. You know, it's marketed one way, the reality is something different. And if you're bombarded, or as I say, carpet bombing the mindscape with misinformation of unhealthy products that are telling you these are going to what's make you going to be cool, this is what's going to make you healthy, uh, I think not. And statistically, that data is very evident today. And it's obvious. So really what we had was we had sort of the Pied Pipers of the most popular characters with noble causes as a general practice. And this is never talked about. It kind of blows my mind. Just becoming the brands on the worst quality health products for new generations. So now we have a di childhood di diabetes immense problem in America and obesity immense problem in America. They're changing the size of the chairs in public schools to deal with this. But I don't want to slam Disney. I want to point out a possibility. Uh, the possibility is recently, I think, dem being demonstrated by something Chipotle is doing. And have you all seen the, the film uh, that they're releasing? They're releasing films about how they're no longer going to support factory farming. But they're doing it because they're doing it through the social network. They could never do advertisements that would do this because they would be shut down by the network that would say, well, if you say this, you know, you're conflicting in direct conflict with our seven other largest advertisers, and uh, we're going to have to say no. So what they started saying is, I really recommend watch this film. I didn't want to spend three minutes of this talk showing it. Uh, it came out about a little over a week ago. It's called uh, Chipotle Scarecrow. And what it does is it takes a passage through a guy who works in a factory farm. 
and how it changes this whole perspective of the thing. And it's really heart-wrenching, so it's making a lot of traction. But it's the first time a big fast food company has stepped up and said, we're going to do it differently. And they chose to do it through social networks rather than airwaves. And that is resonating uh, in a, largely uh, across the landscape. It's also, it was a big compliment to us because within it, there's about a 30 second homage to our original Oddworld game. And that's what we were talking about, factory farming. And all that came out from my, I call hard boiled observations as uh, my father was nuclear submarines for 17 years. As I was a baby, and we would celebrate Christmas, uh, this is, you know, uh, back around shortly after Bay of Pigs. And he would be gone three to six months at a time. They were running lots of experiments. Uh, how long can people stay under this, the North Pole? You know, months, how long? And so I'd be home, you know, at the same time I'm learning about who is Santa Claus. Uh, we had a little globe, and I was looking at the world as a globe because I'd say, where's Daddy? And Daddy's over here. Daddy's over here. He's in these different places. So I had this just inherently more global perspective, but it was like, what's he doing? Well, you know, he's on the ship that's probably going to end the world. So as a little child, what was being programmed in simultaneously as the mythologies of like Christmas, what was also being programmed in was you're probably never going to die of old age. Because I was learning about thermonuclear war, global thermonuclear war, got this tall, and that was just a built-in perception. Now at the same time, we started getting color TV, yay, and then right away, boom, we watched you know, people being napalmed in Vietnam. This is what started coming on with that. My first love was fishing. I used to escape into the, grew up on the Connecticut River, and, uh, and watched species disappear just from encountering streams and rivers every year. And you could find oftentimes it might be one factory upstream. I watched the blue crabs disappear. I watched the salmon disappear. I had my favorite lakes that I used to fish in in Vermont. I watched them die entirely. They were still gorgeous. They still had, you could see 20 feet down. There was not one living thing because of acid rain was killing them. And these things are like, what the hell is going on as a kid? Now today we have the millennials, they're seeing something different. You know, if you, if you just search Google for fish kills in the last year, and you go, what is going on? Why are the birds dropping out of the sky? These are the things we'd usually rather not talk about because we'd rather focus on profit. So for us, I felt like, how do we do what Orwell was doing, what Seuss was doing? How do we take these ideas, and what Lucas had done, how, take these ideas that are so messed up we don't want to talk about them, but repackage them into sort of a, 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 a comedy of irony? And that was the birth of really the thinking of Oddworld. And I focused on the first character, which is a slave laborer in a factory farm who thought he had a good job, and he finds out the retirement plan's a lie, and he's actually the next food product. <coughs> The second one was the last of his kind, he's the last sole survivor of his species, and he's living in a pharmaceutical research facility, you know, being tested on for safer fabric softeners. The next one was a moose in hunting season who had to live in disguise, was trying to be something he wasn't. By the time he has no choice and he has to embrace who he is, he winds up freeing the privatized water to a people who desperately need it. So, so he was trying to embody this in ways, in comedic ways, to make a message palatable but subtle because no one wants the sandbox. No one wants a documentary in games. We want to have fun. We can't lose sight of that. I felt like Star Wars did that wonderfully. Kubrick does that wonderfully. Spielberg does that wonderfully. You might get the more messages that are there, but if you don't, it's still a great film. And as soon as we don't have a great film, a great game, we might as well stop. So how do we embrace these things in more, uh, you know, genetically gene splicing in, more intelligent messaging, more things that would wake up people <coughs> in ways that might affect their life in more positive ways. Because as a kid growing up, at a certain point in my life, I came to believe the most endangered natural resource that we have is hope. And to our youth, that's it, hope. And for me, that was the hardest thing to find. And it took a while. So I started thinking, how do, how do we get out of this mess? You know, how, how can we better use media to try and address these problems without, you know, without just be, being a protester or, or things that I would never, you know, wouldn't have done. And how do we do that as artists and storytellers? Well, the fact is, song makers, poets, novelists have been showing us for hundreds of years how to do this. And what I was thinking was, okay, conscious con consumerism. So if we're now attracting, our first love in life is fly fishing. And it's all about providing the right pattern that the fish is going to take. And you're tricking the fish. So that's really what packaging is, right? Now, if we're looking at uh, what is the dominant selling 
consumer foods in the fast food space over the last 30 years, they were largely crap. Now, if you argued over this with someone 30 years ago, they would argue back that you don't know what you're talking about. They're fine. The FDA would never allow anything that would be bad for people. <laughs> yeah. Well, the NSA and all that is telling us a lot of more insight into these things today. You have to find the information on documentaries. It's not going to be broadcast to you through the airwaves. Uh, it's not going to come through the major papers. Uh, if you want a desanitized version, we have to go outside of those mainstreams. What my thinking was was that, well, we're not going to be perfect, but what if we can do things to just influence little percentages of improvement? So instead of just being a fully crappy meal for someone, what if it has a 15%, you know, instead of being the highly processed, uh, refined sugar laden, packed garbage, what if it's a, a, a better nutritious product, but it's still put in the same wrapper? So we still have the same pattern attracting the fish, but maybe it's better for them. It's just, it doesn't have the things that are going to lead them to a lot of problems in their life. The other thing that was happening is as we got responses from this, that was actually quite surprising. We had people sending us handwritten letters about somehow how our products, experiencing our products, how, had taught them to laugh again, had taught that they were on the edge of suicide, and it's how, they, how these things saved their lives. And this, and this was not one, not two, but the, it, it just kept on coming, and we could find, wow, we're actually having influence. And then uh, the tattoos of, of fans, you know, and there's actually today, there's hundreds and hundreds of these people who got tattoos of our work. And I was like, wow, you know, this is, it's kind of, what happens if I sell a cell to the out, you know? Are these guys going to be hunting me down at night? You know, they branded this stuff on their bodies, which we weren't trying to promote, but it, it was proving that it, it had a deeper, deeper relevance to people and it meant something to them and they wanted to be attached to it. And this brings me to the value perspectives of being a, uh, a developer in a publisher relationship really trying to swing for the fence and knock out hits. And in the beginning, our first product, this is not, and this is not about trashing any particular company, any particular publisher, it's not about that. It's just the trend of a developer and the cycles we experience. This was our cycle. In the beginning, uh, we had never made a game. We made this game called Abe's Odyssey. Uh, we were able to raise some VC to start the company. Then we were able to have a publisher buy them out. They were very excited about it. They gave us a lot of support, and they had some hopes. They thought, you know, maybe we could sell a million or so units. And we actually overshot that quite well. And with the circumstances of that day, the stars were more aligned. So what I have on the yellow columns is that was the expectations. The green columns is those were the actuals. Those were the results. And uh, the black column is those were the foobars. You know, it's a military term, right? Effed up beyond all repair. And so the foobars were what could we not control? And how did that influence the performance of our product? So we get into the second game, and uh, the expectations were relatively conservative. It was a sequel. Sequels weren't known to, to really excel better. The company needed uh, money for the next, within a year for the quarter. We did it. Uh, expectations were lower than our actuals before, but FUBARs, beyond our control, we had lower sales. However, in the financial space, they don't talk about how many games got lost in a distribution company's warehouse when the commercials were running, right? Or the next game. How many territories were lost because of poor strategy by a console install that completely missed our number one performing territory? Uh, or the fourth game. How many series of controls happened where we were supposed to have a multi skewed product and a relationship was supposed to handle the other part, we don't have it, and then we wind up with zero marketing campaign exposure? None of that is written in the financial history books. What's written is, this is your performance. Right, now, each time, these factors are going beyond our control. Each time, the expectations are high, thinking you can do it again. You can knock it out of the park. You can get at least that high. But in actuality, our actual sales were dropping. So if I'm talking to a VC, if I'm talking to a publisher, they're telling me why, you know, maybe it's just a depreciating brand. You know, it's devaluing, so the next projection would be even lower. And, but why don't we talk acquisition? You know, it's a good team, why don't we do that? And we're looking at this as creators, and we're going, we don't believe that this is what should have happened, but we can understand why it did, and we can understand that these were factors completely beyond our control. And we're, you know, we're fuck-ups too, so. In 2005, we shot down the operation because we didn't want to sell. It wasn't about that. We didn't want to give the characters to a uh, foster home. And 
we did not feel as though we had achieved our objectives. And our objectives were, if we could really build popular characters that had a different level of integrity sort of in their subtext, then our terms would be, if we wanted to license them, I wanted to create a new model. If we could get popular, could we license to only companies, food companies, et cetera, that were performing X percentage better practices? And, <laughs> you know, so if you ever want to get thrown out of a licensing office, just say that, you know, because they're like, oh, great, man. Because they come in and they go, hey, I think we could do these. This would be great. He was a factory farmer. Let's have him in, uh, let's go on McDonald's. And I was like, eh. So, you know, we kind of looked stupid because that's, that's not the play. The play is you go, you get the highest dollar. But it didn't align at all with what the intent was of those characters. So um, sometimes for creators, uh, some things are more important than money. And then we get into the indie role, and in 2008, we find that Steam is that can actually deliver our packets. Uh, miraculously, through the years, we'd actually retain attention, retain the uh, ownership of our licensing, of all of our products, of all of our IP. And we started in little basic ways. And I didn't really want to make games under the old model because I felt the foo bars were beyond my control. I was tired of it. I was working around the clock, doing it all the time, getting really excited, and then getting disappointed, and always uh, getting hammered in the financial circumstances, and then inevitably could not sign any more contracts, and those of you in the business know this, at a high AAA level uh, without having a built-in path to acquisition. And it was never about that. It was about building things that would become more successful, and we could all hopefully you know, prosper from that, all partners included. So what happened in the beginning is we just figured out why don't we just start getting that back up and just do digital distribution? We're no longer relying on the publishers. We're no longer relying on the retail outlets. Uh, all of these links in the chains, uh, the, uh, the cost of good and the, the distribution chain, uh, they're largely eliminated. A lot of those middlemen uh, practices and possibilities of failure are eliminated. So we can go directly to the audience. So we started doing this. And what happened was our expectations were very, very low because we couldn't afford any ad dollars. And just going three years from 2005 to 2008 and, and paying for it was quite an investment because you have to keep your IPs alive, you have to pay for your copyrights, your trademarks around the world, not cheap. So, you know, six figures a year and you're doing that year after year, yet the distribution chain isn't there yet to take it to the next level. So our expectations were really low. And then we were really surprised because our actuals started shooting over it. And we found that in doing so, we were able to do something we were never able to do in the past which is we were able to start connecting with the people who were actually buying our games. And through the social networks, through Facebook, through our own websites, through uh, Steam, in the beginning, uh, we were able to, to get a more in instantaneous conversation with, something, with someone who at retail, some, some had done this, we never were able to figure it out. Find out who all those people were who were buying your games and actually have a dialogue with them. And I didn't want to build anything that wasn't going to be totally AAA again. I just, I'd rather not play. But when starting to talk to the audience, they go, yeah, that's really nice and that would be really great, but why don't you give us something? And you're like, you're kidding, right? Because I'm just expecting to get totally hammered if I don't have a hit. And they're going, that's not the point. We love the universe. Build something. Give us something. So we're like, well, this is all the money we have. We'll you know, remake something. Do it, do it this way or that. And so it was a very humbling experience to find out what the end user actually thought versus the perceptions of what we think, who are usually dealing you know, more with the finances and the various partners at, at a financial level, which is looking at a different history. Now we're getting more in touch with the people who affected it. And what we were finding right away was that our initial audience had a very rich reaction to the products, and they wanted now their second generation of, of kids to have them. So they wanted to play that game with their kids the way my mom wanted to read Dr. Seuss to me, the way it was read to her. And uh, it was very humbling because it, 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 it was like, you had, you, you had this, you had to identify that you didn't have, you could go much smaller than you previously thought was possible. And in doing that, we just, you know, not necessarily new big creative titles, but just getting on different SKUs and, with, with uh, you know, smaller investments, just widening out, getting on more networks, our product too. Now, we kept on being really conservative in our estimates. It really changed because before we were thinking like, you know, like sports players, like, just let me up there, man. I'll swing for it. I'll knock it out of the park, you know. And you're thinking like a hit maker, like a filmmaker. And really, you, got, you need to be a lot smarter than that in the business. And we weren't that smart in the business. But we started to look at it more frugally. We started to understand it differently. And the foo bars were greatly reduced. Like we had them, some of them, some of them were ours, 
Some of them would happen outside, but they were really minuscule in the scheme of things relative to what was happening in the past. Each time we would invest more money and we would, uh, in baby steps of what we could self-fund, and each time we were two to three xing our returns. But at 1.5x return, we found we could keep people employed. Now, I've had VC, uh, I've had publishers. If you're in VC, they want a 10x return on the money they're lending. So you need to perform or else everyone's out of a job. If you're with a publisher, most of them are public companies. They, they're looking for at least a 5x return or you're a loser. And that's all understandable. There's a lot of responsibilities out there. There's a lot of people depending on uh, those investments to pay off. But that wasn't really the purpose of why we created that brand. And so when we were looking at stepping it up each time, if we got a 1.5x return, people still had jobs, maybe a couple more got hired, and we could keep the integrity of aiming for this ladder to where we could get back to the point where we were really self-financing new AAA content. And that's where we're closer to today. So each time, we're doing very well. This time, uh, we, started, we, we had enough money that uh, we were asking the audience in the conversation, what would you like to see? We can't afford that, <laughs> okay, what else would you like to see? And we started polling them. And this was really interesting because they love that dialogue, right? And a lot of you understand this far better than I do when it comes to managing your social. So I'm just re revealing uh, not the most brilliant strategies out there, but what our experience was. And in having that conversation, they said, if you, why don't you redo Abe's Odyssey with newer technology? We love that game. We love it. And it was like, could we? And I would never think to do it. But I was thinking of Dr. Seuss. And I was thinking, you know, Dr. Seuss, uh, every time they came out with a better printing process, better paper, harder cover, nicer inks, color saturation, they didn't change the story. They had the same story with a newer technology. And but then in the film industry, it was very different, right? Like, very seldom would a remake be as good as the original, because they always felt like they needed to write a new script, they always needed to add new effects, they needed to change it around, make it more relevant, and usually it sucked. Time Machine is my, one of my favorite movies, and I was so disappointed with the remake. I was like, couldn't you just take the same script and modernize it, modernize the visuals? So we did that on Abe's and Odyssey, and we started seeing a really, uh, we started to do that with Abe's Odyssey, and we started to see this really positive resonance back. But it took us into a slightly scary territory because we, to date, have not really been spending anything in the indie life on advertising. Uh, it's a difficult thing to find out, figure out anyway, in online, as everyone knows. And so instead, we focused on the people. So if we could capture our community pool, if we could capture our fans, then we would rely on that social spread to give us enough visibility to at least get that 1.5x return. And so now we're taking our biz biggest bets, and now we're into the, you know, the seven multi seven-figure dollar bets, but it's still very small compared to, you know, just come back from E3, some of the guys that you guys make, some of the games that you guys make. I mean, they're awesome, right? 100 million, 200 million dollar games now. We're still in like this high, which really blew my mind when Sony said, hey, we saw that game you showed. We want to have it on the platform. We want you to self-publish. Um, will you do that? And we'll send you dev stations. It was like, pfft. <laughs> what? That never happened before. So that changed our whole curve and perspective on how we saw the possibility. And the culture of the people that would build the types of games that we were making was something that we saw we could actually nurture better here because really the pressure was coming from ourselves. We were either going to fail or succeed on this on our own. And what we also learned was how we could start to co-create with the audience. So what happened in this process is we were like, well, what do we name the game? And they would ask me, what do we name the game? We work with a, a JAW has been a great development relationship with us. They're in Otley in the UK. And I said, what do we name the game, Lauren? I said, I don't know. Let's ask the audience. So we poll the audience. And you get back unbelievable results. Now, I've hired uh, PR firms in the past. I've hired great creatives in the past. Uh, tried to hire creative groups in the past as services. And we got back, and the first thing we did is submit to us, you know, maybe only tens of thousands of people that were asking, submit to us what you would call the game. And we got back you know, thousands of terrible names, but we got like hundreds of amazing names. Ones I never would have got from creative directors, ones I never would have got from hiring a, a creative firm. And, and then we found titles for future titles, you know, out of that. And then we narrowed it down, and then we let the audience keep on voting for what was their favorites. So we started doing that the way 
you know, closer to how uh, social and online, online live games work today, which is A-B testing, you're finding out more from the audience. So we were involving the audience sooner, and they started shaping the product earlier. And it was very enlightening and very exciting. So we'd say, well, they'd say, uh, first, what should the game be? Really? The audience picked it. What should the game be named? The audience picked it. And we're looking at fan out art there, and we just see some incredible stuff that we never would have thought of ourselves. We said, hey, could we use your art for the cover art? They're ecstatic. Hey, can we use your song for the credit sequence? We did this across the board. We found there was a lot of people. There was rock stars. There was actors. There was well-known people that were huge fans of these games, and they loved them with their children. So we go, hey, we're redoing all the Mudokans talking to each other. Would you give us a hello? Would you give us a follow me? Would you give us five words? And so in the new game, they're giving it to us. We have you know, very well-known people that love games, love rich content, and they want to see you succeed. And it was, that was very humbling as well, because in the old model, you're always paying for that. But what you found when you had this sincere relationship with the audience, and you're not trying to say, hey, we're the best, and we're gonna go, we're gonna go really take uh, retail this Christmas. Instead, you're just going, we just really hope we can survive. <laughs> you know, they're actually rooting for you a lot more. And this just goes to the possibilities. And the possibilities that I saw in the beginning was, can we do Trojan horse pop? Can we make smarter content that some people will get and those that don't might hopefully just enjoy that could create a branded characters and licensing that could go on fed products that have better practices? Not perfect practices, better practices. And it was amazing to see what Chipotle had done recently because uh, they're actually doing it. They're actually a big company who's saying, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, we're going this way. And the films that they made, if you watch them, they'll almost make you cry. I mean, they are that powerful, they're that good. And they're very controversial, so there's a lot of things happening that people are attacking them and saying, but you're still killing cows, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but they go into the very specifics of how they're going to change their market. But they're doing it through entertainment now, which is very interesting. And they could never get it on the airwaves. So on this note, I just wanted to uh, take this time tell you a bit of our story, tell you the curve of perceived value that was happening under the old, the old model, and, uh, which was really this, and the trends of what's happening in the new model. And the beauty of the new model is there's only continuing uh, networks opening up. So we found very quickly, at first we were like, well, we can get on Steam and sell in North America. Well, today that's eight networks, global, over 20 languages, our whole library, and we've taken you know, what we've been able to do and just get it out there and build stores wherever possible. And in that model, you can see it's only going to increase. The old world is not going to re return. It's over. Apple stores changed that. Android changed that. The way we think changed that. That's why it was very obvious if you came out of E3 that Microsoft had to change. Because if they didn't, they were, they were not going to fail. If they tried to keep that old world model, it was going to blow up in their face. And it did. So they had to change. It was obvious if you were watching. And in that, it's a great thing, because these changes are the possibilities. And what's wonderful is that because we're a connected world, it's just not whoever has the most money wins. The, act the audience actually has a voice back. And that's shaping the world back today. And to me, that's very exciting. It got me a lot more interested in making games again. Uh, I hope to keep on making them. And really, it's just been great to be able to uh, be here, be at DICE. DICE has been a lot of things over the years. Uh, I helped, you know, thrilled to have helped uh, put it together in the beginning. And it's great to see it here in London. And I'm really glad that I could share this with you. And I hope you had some value in it. Thank you.